Nation, election administrator to improve Cherokee citizens' voter registration and participation in county, state, and federal elections. And then we have Gail Fanumier, and she is the election director for Alaska's Division of Elections. And in 2015, Gail served as the president of NASED. Then we have Will Senning. And Will is the Director of Elections and Campaign Finance in the Vermont Secretary of State's office. And he has served as director for nine years and spent two years prior to that as election administrator in the, the same office. And as those of us at the cheese tasting learned, he's also a fierce uh, uh, defender of Vermont cheddar. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here. Uh, really excited to hear, uh, to learn from you all today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate being able to, uh, to present and tell you our little story from uh, Cherokee County, Oklahoma. So uh, as you can see on the map, Oklahoma has uh, 39 recognized tribes in the state. Uh, we'll focus on the Cherokee Nation, which you'll see is up in the northeast section of the uh, state. The jurisdiction for the Cherokee Nation is 14 counties, and it, Oklahoma does not have reservations, but they have tribal jurisdictions, and within those tribal jurisdictions, there's designated tribal land. Uh, not all the Cherokee Nation citizens live within the uh, jurisdiction. Uh, they live across the state, and there are even uh, Cherokee Nation citizens across the United States. And so, uh, a fun fact about Cherokee Nation citizenship, uh, it does not require a blood quantum, so, but you must be a direct descendant of the signer of, or of a signer of the Dawes Roll to be able to be a Cherokee Nation citizen. So, we uh, started a project. I, I worked with the, uh, the election administrator at the Cherokee Nation, and uh, we, we got to visiting, and, and we wanted to increase uh, dual registration uh, with Cherokee Nation citizens. Um, we didn't really have any guide posts. Uh, we didn't have a real direction, but we had a desire to, to increase those voters um, or those numbers of voters. Uh, I started in Cherokee County in 2014, uh, but I'd seen the same issues in Adair County, which is also part of the Cherokee Nation, um, that there just wasn't as much uh, dual registration as we thought there should be. So what we knew when we started in that first meeting we knew we didn't have any money to do anything. We, we, we didn't have an initiative. Uh, we didn't have buy-in from anyone else but the two of us. And so we, we started uh, putting our heads together, uh, looking at all the things that were gonna cause us to fail and the couple of things that maybe we could do right and, and, um, and increase that registration. Um, looked at the the amount of distrust of many tribal members uh, that they had towards the state and federal government. And if any of you've ever heard about the Trail of Tears, you can understand why. Uh, Cherokee Nation was working on their own trust issues in their, their elections. Um, you can Google it up. As uh, Bob Stoops used to say, Google it up. You, you can uh, uh, look and find um, shootouts and uh, armed sieges uh, regarding Cherokee Nation uh, elections. And uh, we knew that there was some, some mistrust there, but they had been working for a couple of years trying to modernize those elections. In fact, uh, in previous to 2012, the Carter Center had even sent uh, observers to observe those Cherokee Nation elections to try to mitigate some fraud. So if I'd have known that I'd be talking about this several years later, I'd have taken a lot better notes as we were doing it, obviously. Uh, we, just, we just got to work. And uh, 
most of the evidence I've got is anecdotal, but we, we focused on what we were doing. But as you can see, uh, these, are, these are current registration uh, numbers and, and numbers from uh, 2012. And the population numbers are total population of the uh, nation, the Cherokee Nation, and that's total population across the entire uh, U.S. Uh, I couldn't find any uh, numbers broken out by voting age. So that's what we got. They, they started in 2012 with 17% of the total population registered to vote in their elections and now they're at 19 percent so of those registered voters that live in oklahoma uh, of those 75,000, there's 56,000 of them that live inside the state of oklahoma and we've increased that number to 44,000 who are dual registrants and that's that's a that's a great number for us that's 79 percent and in Cherokee County, where we, we focused our efforts, uh, the dual registration of those, uh, those citizens is 87% now. So uh, when we started, we, we uh, estimated that it was about 68%. And so that's a, that's a, a pretty major increase of nearly 20% over the last uh, 10-ish years. So what did we do? We just sat down and got to work. You know, we, we made that list and said, let's try it. We tried it. If it didn't work, we pitched it. And uh, some of the things that did uh, come out of that that worked very well is every time I gave a speech, every time I gave a talk, every time I talked to just about anybody, we talked about dual registration for Cherokee Nation citizens. Um, went to the nation, went to their, their events, tried to uh, get involved and make sure that they saw us and tried to build those relationships. Uh, we sought out those registered voters, those Cherokee Nation citizens, to become poll workers. And another fun fact about the Cherokee Nation, it's a matriarchal society. And what the women say goes. I mean, I think my house is very matriarchal too, um, now that I think about it. <laughs> um, but, but actively recruiting those Cherokee elder women as polling workers really helped uh, spread the word that, hey, you really should get involved and, and vote in state and local elections. Um, right now, I, I talked to the, the current uh, county election board secretary uh, just before I got here, and she said that 56 percent of her poll workers currently are now Cherokee Nation citizens. So that, that's, a, that's a number that we just kept trying to increase every year and, and they're at 56%. Um, we, like I said, we went to uh, events and festivals. We um, established polling places on tribal land. We uh, worked with the, with the Cherokee Nation to use some of their buildings as polling places. We work together to share polling places so that voters voting in the uh, Cherokee Nation elections also voted in the same place when they voted in uh, state and county elections. Um, a large component of, of our success was, you know, I said that Cherokee Nation had, had worked to try to improve their uh, election system. And a, and a large uh, uh, a bit of that success goes to those tribal leaders uh, who decided that they wanted a better system. Uh, they adopted many, they took our, uh, our election code 
and our policies and procedures and adopted many of them. So one of the great things now is if you're a Cherokee Nation voter, you can go and vote and you follow basically the same procedures that you follow if you vote in a state and local election uh, with the, with the uh, county election board. Uh, we worked on trust by, you know, the, the, the overall thought is we make registration, voter registration available to everyone and so we want you to come register. But we went to them. We went to, like I said, those, those uh, events that the Cherokee Nation had. Uh, we made a presence uh, to be there and make them feel welcome to, to register. Um, I think that was one of the most important things we do, did. Um, hiring those poll workers that were uh, Cherokee uh, citizens. In fact, uh, two of the, the folks that I had hired while I was uh, uh, the secretary in Cherokee County were Cherokee Nation citizens also, which uh, also made a big deal uh, as far as being able to trust our office and, and uh, we, we're very proud of that. Um, and just, again, I can't say how much, I, I can't tell you how much it helped to have those, those matriarchal leaders working as poll workers. That, that, that made a huge difference in, um, in the trust that we, we gained with those voters. Uh, another thing that was very helpful for, for us, um, our statewide elections uh, are in even numbered years and Cherokee Nation elections are in odd numbered years. Our elections are on Tuesdays, their elections are on Saturdays. So those poll workers can work for both of us. These people are going and they're seeing the same people when they go vote they trust them that's their friends their family their their people it's their people um and that that sharing of of uh, polling places and uh, those schedules are are awesome it's a it's a great thing for us i think i went backwards didn't i so moving forward our goal is to adapt what we've done here in, in uh, the Cherokee Nation and, and take that model to the other 38 tribes there in the state of Oklahoma. And, and as a, a uh, county election official, didn't have much uh, platform for that, but I do now, and I'm going to use it. And so we'll, uh, we'll share that with our other uh, county election board uh, folks, I've I've been in this position for uh, a little over a year, and so I've really tried to keep my nose above the water so far. But this is this is coming soon, and and will spread out across the state. And we hope that that uh, that it just improves our voting numbers uh, all over the state. And so, with that. I'll turn it over to Gail. All right, thanks for having me here today. Uh, greetings from the land of the midnight sun, literally, sometimes. Um, here to talk just about how the adventures we have in elections in Alaska. Uh, I'm gonna show you some slides that are just gonna outline what our state looks like and um, how things happen. So how big is Alaska? Okay, I'm gonna tell you this. My PR person is from Corpus Christi, Texas, okay? She went to Texas Tech. She's a proud fan of Patrick Mahomes. So this, my notes say, this slide is to just to establish the mental image of how big Alaska is, and I guess to make fun of Texas, but I do not like this slide. That's from Tiffany, who's our great PR person. 
So here are some things I'm just going to talk about. Um, we have only 401 precincts statewide. I say only because I feel kind of like inadequate up here when I hear about, you know, precincts that have the size of 8,000 registered voters and whatnot. But we have 28 full-time staff. We only have 597,000 registered voters. Um, and then we have limited internet coverage throughout the state. Um, we have to translate information into languages and the majority of those languages are historically unwritten. And so we have to have, uh, we have panels that meet and they basically come up with words that they feel their speakers will understand to like translate microphone. Microphone to us may be a word that's like five words that takes up this much space on a piece of paper. Um, and then the only 20% of Alaska is accessible by roads. So if we have an emergency on election day, we can't just hop in a car and drive to Barrow and get them a new piece of equipment. So, um, so on, if you can see on here, the, um, the red lines with the yellow highlights are interstate highways. And the blue lines are our Alaska Marine Highway. So that's our ferry system. And that's how a lot of people actually get from one place to another. You get on a boat and you take a ferry. There's a solid red line that kind of goes up the middle of the state. And that's um, like the ice haul trucker road that gets you up to North Slope part of the state. You can see on the Northwestern part of the state, there are no blue or red or yellow lines. So basically, um, that side of the state relies on airports, airplanes, small airplanes. We have um, three major airports in the state. I would say those would be in Anchorage, uh, Fairbanks, and Juneau. A bigger, um, well, Nome, Alaska has an airport as well, well as Barrow. So in Alaska, the state um, conducts the election. So we are centralized. We do it all. We don't do... The locals only do their own local elections. Um, so I know there's a few other states that are like that, but we are pretty much in the minority when it comes to that. We have five regional offices um, located in Juneau, Anchorage, Awasilla, Fairbanks, and Nome. And um, like I said, our locals don't handle elections. They just do their own local elections. We're responsible for state and federal elections. Um, and it's helpful because that means that everybody is singing from the same sheet of music. We all use the same equipment. We all follow the same rules. They all receive the same training. So there are some significant advantages to that. But this also means that um, the 28 full-time employees are responsible for a significant amount of work. Um, <coughs> preparing forms, training, providing storage, testing, and transporting of all of the equipment and forms um, in order for our 401 precincts to be able to conduct elections. And we do elections in person. Vote by mail is optional. So um, there are significant logistics involved in getting the materials out to states. Not only that, but also getting the information out to our limited English proficient voters in the, the languages that I talked about that we um, provide instructions and election information to them. We have sample ballots in um, a variety of languages. We do Tagalog again now in the Kodiak area and then the Aleutian chain, which is that long strip going down into the, um, the Bering Sea. Um, as well as um, Yupik is our main um, Alaska native language. It has multiple dialects, so we do about nine different dialects of Yupik. And that, that encompasses the northwestern part of the state, so the Nome area, the flag there, all of that area that has no road pretty much is covered by Yupik languages. And then we have Gwich'in, which is um, in the central part of the state, so some communities outline of Fairbanks, which is the flag kind of right in the middle. So, you know, we have to mail our precinct scanners to a lot of our precincts. We have to mail registers. We have to get poll booths, ballot boxes, tablets, printers, um, paper ballots. 
Um, so there's a significant amount of items that we have to rely on the Postal Service to get to and from locations. So the bulk of Alaska's population lives in the Anchorage and Matsu area. But, um, you know, over half of our 401 precincts are not located in those areas, and over 200 are not on the road system. So these, this map just kind of, the little dots, this is part of our new interactive um, map as it relates to redistricting, show you where all the polling places are throughout the state. Um, every little community, whether they have a population of 300 or a population of, uh, you know, 200,000, have polling places available to them on election day. So, as I mentioned, uh, because the majority of our state does not have roads connecting them, um, we rely on the post office, which then relies on small airplanes, which then relies on Mother Nature to cooperate to get materials from the regional offices to the polling places. So we have to plan quite a bit in advance to get materials out there. We start mailing our election supplies about three weeks before the election because we have to account for delays that are really totally outside of our control. And in Alaska, the mail mainly from the northwestern part of the state has to funnel through Anchorage first, and then it goes out to the, the communities. So for example, to get something from our Nome regional office to Barrow, so Nome's on the left side of the map and Barrow's at the tip top of the state, it has to go to Anchorage and then go from Anchorage to get up to Barrow. And that process can take anywhere from five to 10 days. So that has to go there and back after each election. And the other problem is um, a lot of, we have a difficulty being able to use tracking with our equipment because not all post offices in some of these small communities, even though they have tracking available, they don't utilize it. So that makes it difficult for us when we contact precincts and say, hey, uh, did you get your ballots? Did you get your equipment? And they say, oh no, it's not here yet. So then we have to contact the post office and say, we're looking for a yellow Pelican case, a red Pelican case, a red bag, and it went to Toon Toon Tuliac on this date and they still haven't received it yet. So this is a rough cost of what, a uh, rough estimate of what it cost us for postage and freight to get our equipment supplies to and from precincts. And um, this was an estimate from uh, 2018 because in 2020, um, things were really wacky because of COVID. Um, but obviously costs have increased. And so we expect to see a substantial increase in these costs for the 2022 election cycle. Um, and then ballot transportation um, after election night to get materials back to the division, to the, to the director's office and my office in Juneau is about $90,000. Um, poll workers that live in urban areas return all their supplies back to their regional office. Otherwise, uh, again, we rely on the post office and little tiny airplanes to get it to Anchorage, that, to get it to, um, back to the regional offices. So we hire, um, like everybody, poll workers. We have to train them, and there are challenges, of course, associated with that because we can't just hop in a car and get everywhere. Um, so the other thing, recruitment is very challenging um, because, not believe it or not, not everybody has a telephone in their home. And even if they do, sometimes uh, Mother Nature decides it's going to get ugly and uh, knock the power out for a few days places, and it makes it very hard to reach people. Um, we do training in person as much as possible. Um, it's a complicated process, but we, we, we try because we feel that's the best way to have hands-on in-person training. Or if we have to, we do it online with um, using videos that we've made um, and our handbooks. Uh, we also utilize uh, outreach workers 
in communities, specifically focusing on bilingual outreach workers in our communities that require language assistance um, to help us get the word out about the election and also to um, help us find workers and other specific election-related information. So unless the precinct is in one of our um, five cities where we have regional offices, um, there's a, like I said, there's a significant amount of travel involved and um, staff has to fly out to some of these small communities and we do hub training. So we try to bring uh, election workers in from communities in a surrounding area to a group. So we're able to hit more communities on one trip versus way back like in the 80s, we used to fly everywhere. We chartered planes and we would fly from, we would do three or four communities in a day. Um, it, it was pretty crazy. And some places I remember going to um, Savunga, which is a little island outside of Nome, uh, landing there in a small plane. Uh, I was like five months pregnant and got met uh, by people on four wheelers ready to take us to town. So that's how we, that's what we experience. <laughs> um, so again, it involves our permanent staff because we, we can't really hire people to train. Uh, one, that's another person you have to hire and two, you have to train the trainer and that takes time. And so um, we do have, we are fortunate in some of our offices to have um, people that have done this for us in the past and, and are interested and enjoy doing it that do help us do some of the training. So in Southeast, we have to fly um, to all communities except for Juneau. Uh, in Anchorage, we can drive down to the Kenai Peninsula Borough and do training down there. Fairbanks um, can, is, can get to many of their communities on the road system, but the Nome office has to, uh, to fly um, to a lot of different locations. So we spent about uh, almost $300,000 in 2018 to do election worker training. Um, in 2020, we did it all by video, online, phone, because um, due to COVID. And again, uh, we expect this cost to be more this year just because the cost of doing business everywhere has gone up significantly. So, we only have about 67% of our state that I would say has has a reliable internet, good, good coverage. Uh, so that means we can't rely on educating voters and recruit workers in the ways that a lot of other states do. Um, so we get um, we get we have about uh, 12 television markets that we're able to do ads on and do. Um, advertisements and videos on. Um, radio and print is also very important in Alaska because it covers areas, whoops, it went too far. It covers areas that, um, that don't get television coverage. So we rely a lot on radio ads, uh, public service announcements. We pay for those, they're translated. Um, and um, it's, it's fun, but it's definitely a challenge. So um, if you ever wanna to come to Alaska during an election cycle, we could definitely put you to work. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gail. <clears throat> and good morning, everybody. Almost, almost done the morning. I'm gonna give the obligatory, I'm the last presenter before lunch comment. Um, so hope you can all bear with me. And um, I was glad to see that Rusty and Gail had lots of pictures and maps um, and graphics because I have none. Um, I do have lots of legal text though that we'll, we'll look at. Um, felt a little better after I saw Judd's slides yesterday, which were um, similarly put together. So I am talking about um, how in Vermont we facilitate voting by people who are incarcerated. Um, to my knowledge, I believe that uh, Vermont and Maine are the only states that allow voting um, from folks who are currently in prison. Um, DC is, is getting close or is somewhere along the way. They're not here uh, this week or I would have checked in to, to have more details about their progress in that regard. Um, 
And so what I wanted to say is that the, the subject of the, of the entire panel is reaching hard to reach communities, right? And I think um, my subject matter here is a little different and distinguished um, because there's really the, the threshold question first um, of whether folks who are either convicted of crimes of, of various um, levels and natures and or confined in prison should even have the right to vote in the first place. Um, and I wanted to make clear that I'm really not here to advocate one way or another um, in that regard. Um, but however, and I mentioned this to Amy yesterday, that I, I still, for those who may be interested in reaching these individuals, um, really the first step, of course, is restoring their eligibility or making them eligible um, under your law. So I am going to focus on kind of how our law is structured in that regard first, um, and then I'll move on to describe some of the ways we, we help facilitate the actual voting. So in terms of the law, of course, it starts with the Constitution. And um, what I've got here is Chapter 2, Section 42 of the Vermont Constitution, which are the voter qualifications. And you can see that there's really three basic requirements in the Constitution, that you be 18 years of age, a citizen of the US, um, and residing in the state. You note here it says for the period established by the General Assembly. Um, and I'll come back to that, but it's, it's sort of that element of the qualifications that the, the Constitution leaves some latitude for the legislators and the law to define what it means to be a resident, and that's going to be the most important part. Um, I would note they also have the quiet and peaceable behavior. I've always wondered, you know, how that gets judged and um, meted out. I certainly don't um, disqualify anybody because they're not quiet and peaceable, but you'll also note that we have a voter's oath. I left the voter's oath off of here because it's not central to this discussion, but that uh, presents all of its own administrative challenges. You can ask the folks at FVAP about that. So that's the constitutional framework, right? And then I'm going to go through a couple um, provisions in the law. This is our state law. Title 17 is the elections. And 2121 is the basic eligibility provisions. And you can see that that, for the most part, reflects the language um, in the Constitution, which is that you have to be a resident in your town. Um, citizen of the United States and taken the oath and be 18 years of age or more. You actually can register in Vermont now as a 17 year old if you'll be 18 um, before the general election and vote in the primaries if so and then the general election. That's a follow up section to this one here. So then the important part as I was saying is the residency definition. Uh, that's section 2122 in our law. And really quickly, this is the basic residency definition. I just wanted to show this to you all because I don't, you know, I haven't surveyed the residency definitions in other states, but um, the headaches in interpreting and applying this particular language are never ending. If you can tell me what a person who is domiciled in the town is evidenced by an intent to maintain a principal dwelling place in the town indefinitely and to return there if temporarily absent, coupled with an act or acts consistent with that intent means. We can talk this afternoon. There's, um, yeah, as you can see, the, the, the omission of any uh, period of time, certain number of days that you have to be in the state. Um, causes a lot of confusion. But again, that's not central to our discussion here. That's your basic residency definition. And then interestingly, it's actually the subsection before, you can see this is B. Um, A has the operative language for um, this discussion, which is the special cases. You can see I highlight in red. And the way it's written is that a person shall not gain or lose a residence. Now, of course, I'm having trouble reading the red, and you all probably are too shall not gain or lose a residence solely by reason of presence or absence while, and then it goes through a list. You can see some of the other items in the list. Um, but then I highlight while confined in a prison or correctional institution. So the upshot there is that um, if you get sent to prison, you do not gain or lose your residence for purposes of voting. Shall not gain or lose. 
So the first key is that you don't lose your residency, right? When confined in a correctional institution. Um, I know here that there's also, there's the, what, what you don't see, what I can't put in front of you in the law is any other express prohibition related to being convicted of or in prison for a crime. And I have a feeling that's, that's how this is um, dealt with probably in a lot of your other state laws is, is an express statement that um, you lose your right to vote when you either are convicted of a crime or confined in prison. There's the absence of any of that language. So again, it just brings us back to what, what defines a residence because obviously your age doesn't change, your citizenship doesn't change, um, and you can still take the oath. <clears throat> Um, so because you don't lose residency, you're still 18, still a citizen, still will take the oath. Nothing in the law that says you can't be registered and vote once you are convicted or confined. Um, this is really an express statement, right? That you don't lose your residency status. Um, and therefore you're still eligible if you can check the other boxes. Uh, the first part though is also critical, which is that you shall not gain residency, um, while you're confined in a correctional institution. This means um, that you don't, you cannot and do not gain residency and become eligible, eligible to vote in the town or city where the correctional institution is located. That's a big concern for a lot of people. Um, and this language relieves the concern at least um, about undue influence of a prison population on local elections. That's sort of the most common question we get is, if you guys allow this, are you? Um, does that mean that all the people in our prison are registering in our town and able to vote here in our local elections? And it is not. What it means is that incarcerated individuals may either remain registered or they actually can register anew also if they were not previously registered um, in the last town in which they resided before being confined. And so this really mirrors the Yulkava provisions that you retain your residency in the last place you lived before you left the states or went into the military. This particular point can cause some administrative difficulty and questions. I get them from the clerks a lot um, about registrations at former residences um, that may now be occupied by subsequent owners and tenants. Again, it's sort of a, a similar thing I think we see in the Yulkava context sometimes. Various ways to deal with that. Um, so that brings us to administration. That's sort of the end of my legal analysis of our residency law. Um, and the, the top one here is what I was just talking about, that legal addresses for registrations when they're currently occupied. What I would like to do, we haven't um, put it in place yet, but uh, to have a status in our voter registration system and checklist that just says you're registered in that town um, without actually having a physical address identified like we do for um, homeless voters. The, the key thing really is having accurate mailing addresses in prison for all of the absentee voting materials. We'll see in the next couple of slides that um, early in absentee voting is really the, the primary way that these folks vote and um, facilitating, of course, that ability to mail ballots to and from prisons requires Good mailing address records for these folks. Um, a big one, uh oh, did you guys lose it too? I just lost our screen here, Amy. These guys will ver for, verify for me, and of course I don't have a printed one. Can I come around and watch the, oh, it's gone for you guys too. Oh, here we are. Beautiful. Do you guys have it now too? Okay, somebody's doing something. Stand by. Um, one of the biggest issues while he's bringing it back up is access to technology in prison, um, online options. You guys are back. Uh, all of, we are, we are very, um, in Vermont, we make almost all of the registration absentee ballot request activities available online. Um, and of course, it's, it can be really difficult for people in the prisons to take advantage of that who don't have access or a whole lot of time in front of a computer um, with good internet connection. Again, again, to issues with the UOCLAVA voters. Um, I think probably the biggest issue, though, in general, is awareness among the prison population that they are eligible. Um, 
many of them aren't aware that of that right. They assume that they lose their right to vote when they're sent to prison. Um, and so making sure they're just aware of, of that option for them is the sort of primary first step. And then ongoing outreach and um, engaging with partners within and outside of correctional department um, to assist in education and outreach. But really, I think the main point I wanted to impress on folks is if, if um, voters are eligible to vote from prison, the most important thing is to it, that helps the most is just to have voter-friendly early absentee voting rules, which thankfully we do in Vermont. For instance, we have a very long early voting period of 45 days. Um, we have no excuse early in absentee voting. Many options to request absentee ballots online, by phone, by mail, in person. Um, multiple means for return of those ballots by mail, at drop boxes, in person, by others is a particularly important one for the prison populations. We have um, groups, advocates that will go into the prisons and collect voted absentee ballots from prisoners and um, walk them back to the clerks in person. Um, to have tracking options for those ballots so that they know they have them brought back to the clerks or made it there. And brand new to Vermont this year, the ability to cure any defects in the return of your ballots. So I just, you know, as easy as you can make early voting, it's, it's even more important for somebody who's confined in prison and has sort of limited resources to pull it off. Getting close here. Um, so it, there's a lot of outreach and education that takes place. We could always do more. I would like to be better um, in terms of I think it's most important to have, as I put it, your partners on the inside. I sounded like a, I thought I sounded like a mob movie or, um, but we've had the most success when working with DOC, Department of Corrections employees inside the prisons who can engage the inmates in person and provide ongoing assistance. Like I say, we've had moderate success with this in Vermont. I would note that one person can make a very big difference. There is one employee in the Department of Corrections who has kind of taken this upon himself um, and over the last four years has really expanded the, the knowledge and opportunities among the prison population to vote. Um, I intend to continue to improve our collaboration with the DOC to create policies and a culture um, of ensuring inmates are aware of and able to exercise their right. Um, providing information on voting as part of the intake process is one of the, the first steps I'm interested in doing. I'd love it if ever, anytime somebody first sort of arrives at prison and I don't know what kind of package you get before you are sent to your cell, but if it could include information that you are still eligible to vote and how to do so, that would be great. Um, and then provision of appropriate technology to register, request ballots and track. I mentioned most of them do this, um, still still use the paper methods for requesting and mailing ballots back and receiving ballots. Um, and I think it would be the next step to really uh, make them aware of and able to use all of our online options as well to expedite that process. And finally, continuing the outreach and education, it's important to have partners on the outside as well, um, engaging advocacy groups and other individuals interested in performing outreach and education in the prisons. Um, I have very limited resources in my office. My staff is of four and um, have a lot on our plates as we all do. So um, we think it's really, I think it's really key to leverage the help of other organizations in Vermont for us. That's really been the League of Women Voters has um, engaged in the most serious efforts to actually go into the prisons in person, do registration drives, um, take absentee ballot requests back to the clerks and try and facilitate the process. They've been great, um, not only in the women's prison, um, but in all of them. And I think just my advice would be in states that are passing legislation, considering legislation, engage the groups that advocated um, for the law to make these folks eligible to then follow through um, and provide this education and outreach so that those affected actually see the benefit of the law that they were advocating for. Um, and lobbying for legislation around early and absentee voting that makes it easier for incarcerated persons to request, vote, and cast their ballots, um, which I would 
suggest for all voters and including this subset. And I believe that is the end. So thank you. And I put my email on the bottom of the page if anybody has questions or is interested. Well, thank you all so much. That was so uh, interesting and informative and really appreciate that. Um, we can now open it up to any questions that members may have. Judd. I tried to wait for other people. Before. I know I can always count on you I'd, for a question. See, see, <laughs> I'm always there for you. Yep. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for Rusty. So in, in Colorado, we have two Ute reservations, but they're both Utes. And so they have their own governance structure, but they're all members of the same, you know, overarching tribe. Um, but in Oklahoma, you have a number of different tribes. So I'm curious about, uh, and I, I have a little a bit of inside info here. What if you're in Osage and you live in Bartlesville, or you're in a, you're a Cherokee and you live in Pahuska? I mean, what is, how, how does it work when you are not the primary tribe that uh, lives in that area, does do all the same kinds of elements apply, um, and are the same relationships workable to help those people to have their opportunity to vote? It's a little more difficult, obviously. Um, most of those folks that don't live within the jurisdiction of any of the tribes have to vote absentee, so. Um, it's it's tough to get them dual registered. However, uh, with uh, with the uh, relationship we have with Cherokee Nation now, uh, we're able we have I've got their voter registration and we can take those and share that with those county election board secretaries in those outlying uh, uh, counties. For instance, my, my two boys, their mother is a, a Cherokee Nation member, and, and so are they, but they live outside the jurisdiction, so they have to request an absentee ballot, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little more difficult, but we, we can uh, share that information with those county election boards and you know uh, maybe do some outreach that way. I had a question for um, for Gail. Uh, I know that you're also working on implementing ranked choice voting, correct? Um, just wondering sort of as you're training about such a major change and uh, implementing that, how sort of your uh, geography or the hard, sh hard to reach communities, how that factors into your considerations for that implementation? Yeah, that's a big concern of ours because it's a substantial shift in how people vote. Um, as well as our primary, we went from a two ballot primary to a one ballot primary. Everybody uh, top, it's a nonpartisan primary, pick one primary, uh, the top four advance to the general election for the ranked choice voting. So we're, we're, we hired a, um, a professional PR firm to help us get messaging out that has significant experience in reaching these hard to reach places. And they have been um, a godsend to us. But again, we're translating all that information too, and that takes time. Uh, for the first time this year, we actually did direct household mailings in translated languages of information for our special primary we had in June. Um, and I think that's a significant benefit too, but it's, it's uh, it's PSAs, it's uh, social media, it's whatever we can get on television, in print, and directly to the voters at home. And in training, it's also another level of trying to explain to our election workers, you know, what's going to happen if a voter marks their ballot this way or that way, and it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming for them. <laughs> Just building on that a little, I'm curious, what is your primary uh, mechanism for training people? So, you know, are you able to do things like webinars or is it mostly in-person training? Uh, for training, is that what you said? Yeah, I mean, basically we do it, we, we try to go in person as many places as we can. And there are things that pop up like weather that workers can't get into those communities. And so we'll try to reschedule another in-person training 
or we'll have to do like a Zoom training. Uh, we have some, we require them. We send DVDs out to, to some of these places and uh, along with DVD players, just in case they don't have one. Um, we ask them to watch our videos online and then telephone training if needed. So. Other questions? Yeah, please, Judd. Uh, I have another question. So, Will, um, do you, do any of your prisons have or jails have um, polling places on in the facility. Do you, do you allow people to? Because you're you're a same day registration state, right? Correct. So you do you allow people to change their records on election day and vote in person, that kind of thing at a at a prison? No, but thanks for the question, Judd. Because I did. I was just thinking to myself. I didn't mention we have a provision in the law that allows for mobile polling places during the early voting period not on election day. And it was intended for, and the clerks use it mostly for um, assisted living facilities and you know, nursing homes and such, um, where they can go and do the whole process. Register, if they're not registered, request a ballot, vote it, put it in the certificate envelope, sign it, and the clerk brings them back. And I would like to expand that into the prisons um, during the early voting period, for sure. And I also, I had forgotten to mention that this is going to be new in terms of, you know, facilitating early voting um, that we're now mailing a ballot to all voters for the general election coming up. And so that will include any of our uh, prisoners who are currently active registered voters. And so um, that will be interesting for the first time to, to see the proactive mailing of ballots to these people. So now the focus should really be just getting them registered so that they're insured to get that ballot when we send it in September. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much. That was so informative. Really appreciate uh, the presentation.